7. Rouge et Noir! Bond was determined to be completely fit and relaxed for a gambling session which might last most of the night. He ordered a masseur for three o'clock. After the remains of his luncheon had been removed, he sat at his window, gazing out to sea until there came a knock at the door, as the masseur, a Swede, presented himself. Silently, he got to work on Bond from his feet to his neck, melting the tensions in his body and calming his still twanging nerves. Even the long, purpling bruises down Bond's left shoulder and his side ceased to throb, and when the Swede had gone, Bond fell into a dreamless sleep. He awoke in the evening completely refreshed. After a cold shower, Bond walked over to the casino. Since the night before, he had lost the mood of the tables. He needed to re-establish that focus which is half mathematical and half intuitive, and which, with a slow pulse and a sanguine temperament, Bond knew to be essential equipment of any gambler who was set on winning. Bond had always been a gambler. He loved the dry riffle of the cards and the constant unempathetic drama of the quiet figures around the green tables. He liked the solid, studied comfort of card rooms and casinos, the well-padded arms of the chairs, the glass of the champagne or whiskey at the elbow, the quiet, unhurried attention of good servants. He was amused by the impartiality of the roulette ball and the playing cards and their eternal bias. He liked being an actor and a spectator from his chair to take part in other men's dramas and decisions until it came to his own turn to say that vital yes or no, generally on a 50-50 chance. Above all, he liked it that everything was one's own fault. There was only oneself to praise or blame. Luck was a servant and not a master. Luck had to be accepted with a shrug or taken advantage of up to the hilt, but it had to be understood and recognized for what it was and not confused with a faulty appreciation of the odds. For, at gambling, the deadly sin is to mistake bad play for bad luck, and luck in all its moods had to be loved and not feared. Mon saw luck as a woman, to be softly wooed or brutally ravaged, never pandered to or pursued, but he was honest enough to admit that he had never yet been made to suffer by cards or by women. One day, and he accepted the fact, he would be brought to his knees by love or by luck. When that happened, he knew that he too would be branded with the deadly question mark he so recognized often in others, the promise to pay before you have lost, the acceptance of fallibility. But on this June evening, when Bond walked through the kitchen into the salle privée, it was with a sensation of confidence and cheerful anticipation that he changed a million francs into plaques of fifty mille and took a seat next to the chef de partie at roulette table number one. Bond borrowed the chef's card and studied the run of the ball since the session had started at three o'clock that afternoon. He always did this, although he knew that each turn of the wheel, each fall of the ball into a numbered slot, has absolutely no connection with its predecessor. He accepted that the game begins afresh each time the croupier picks up the ivory ball with his right hand, gives one of the four spokes of the wheel a controlled twist clockwise with the same hand, and with a third motion, also with the right hand, flicks the round ball around the outer rim of the wheel anti-clockwise against the spin. It was obvious that all this ritual and all the mechanical minutiae of the wheel, of the numbered slots and the cylinder, had been devised and perfected over the years so that neither the skill of the croupier nor any bias in the wheel could affect the fall of the ball. And yet it is a convention among roulette players, and Bond rigidly adhered to it, to take careful note of the past history of each session, and to be guided by any peculiarities in the run of the wheel. To note, for instance, and consider significant, sequences of more than two on a single number, or of more than four at the other chances down to evens. Bond didn't defend the practice, he simply maintained that the more effort and ingenuity you put into gambling, the more you took out. On the record of that particular table, after about three hours' play, Bond could see little of interest except that the last dozen had been out of favor. It was his practice to play always with the wheel, and only to turn it against its previous pattern and start on a new tack after a zero had turned up. So he decided to play one of his favorite gambits and back two, in this case the first two dozens, each with the maximum, 100,000 francs. He thus had two-thirds of the board covered, less the zero, and, since the dozens pay odds of two to one, he stood to win 100,000 francs every time a number lower than 25 turned up. After seven coup, he had won six times. He lost on the seventh when 30 came up. His net profit was 400,000 francs. He kept off the table for the eighth throw. Zero turned up. This piece of luck churched him further, and accepting the 30 as a finger post of the last dozen, he decided to back the first and last dozens until he had lost twice. Ten throws later, the middle dozen came up twice, costing him 400,000 francs, but he rose from the table 1 million francs to the good. Directly Bond had started playing in maximums. His game had become the center of interest in the table. As he seemed to be in luck, one or two pilot fish started to swim with the shark. Sitting directly opposite, one of these, whom Bond took to be an American, had shown more than the usual friendliness and pleasure at his share of the winning streak. He had smiled once or twice across the table, and there was something pointed in the way he duplicated Bond's movements, placing his two modest plaques of ten meal exactly opposite Bond's larger ones. When Bond rose, he too pushed back his chair and called out cheerfully across the table, Thanks for the ride! Guess I owe you a drink. Will you join me? Bond had a feeling that this might be the CIA man. He knew he was right as they strolled off together towards the bar, after Bond had thrown a plaque of ten meal to the croupier, and he had given a meal to the hussier, who drew back his chair. My name's Felix Leiter, said the American. Glad to meet you. Mine's Bond. James Bond. Oh, yes, said his companion. And now, let's see. What shall we have to celebrate? Bond insisted on ordering Leiter's hanging hangs on the rocks, and then he looked carefully at the barman. A dry martini, he said. One, in a deep champagne goblet. Oui, monsieur. Just a moment. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of quinolillette. Shake it very well until it's ice cold, then add a large, thin slice of lemon peel. Got it? Certainly, monsieur. The barman seemed pleased with the idea.
Gosh, that's certainly a drink, said Lighter. Bond laughed. When I'm, er, concentrating, he explained, I never have more than one drink before dinner. But I do like that one to be large and very strong and very cold and very well made. I hate small portions of anything, particularly when they taste bad. This drink's my own invention. I'm going to patent it when I can think of a good name. He watched carefully as the deep glass became frosted with the pale golden drink, slightly aerated by the bruising of the shaker. He reached for it and took a long sip. Excellent, he said to the barman, but if you can get a vodka made with grain instead of potatoes, you will find it still better. Mais n'enclouons pas de mouche, he added in an aside to the barman. The barman grinned. That's a vulgar way of saying we won't split hairs, explained Bond. But Lighter was still interested in Bond's drink. You certainly think things out, he said with amusement as they carried their glasses to a corner of the room. He lowered his voice. You'd better call it the Molotov cocktail after the one you tasted this afternoon. They sat down. Bond laughed. I see that a spot marked X has been roped off and they're making cars take a detour over the pavement. I hope it hasn't frightened away any of the big money. People are accepting the communist story or else they'd think it was a burst gas main. All the burnt trees are coming down tonight and if they work things here like they do at Monte Carlo, there won't be a trace of the mess left in the morning. Lighter shook a Chesterfield out of his pack. I'm glad to be working with you on this job, he said, looking into his drink. So I'm particularly glad you didn't get blown to glory. Our people are definitely interested. They think it's just as important as your friends do, and they don't think there's anything crazy about it at all. In fact, Washington's pretty sick we're not running the show. But you know what the big brass is like. I expect your fellows are much the same in London. Bond nodded. Apt to be a bit jealous of their scoops, he admitted. Anyway, I'm under your orders, and I'm to give you any help you ask for. With Matisse and his boys here, there may not be much that isn't taken care of already. But anyway, here I am. I'm delighted you are, said Bond. The opposition's got me, and probably you and Matisse too, all weighed up, and it seems no holds are going to be barred. I'm glad the sheep seems as desperate as we thought he was. I'm afraid I haven't got anything very specific for you to do, but I'd be grateful if you'd stick around the casino this evening. I've got an assistant, a uh, Miss Lind, and I'd like to hand her over to you when I start playing. You won't be ashamed of her. She's a good-looking girl. He smiled at Lighter. And you might mark his two gunmen. I can't imagine he'll try a rough house, but you never know. I may be able to help, said Lighter. I was a regular in our Marine Corps before I joined this racket, if that means anything to you. He looked at Bond with a hint of self-deprecation. It does, said Bond. It turned out that Lighter was from Texas. While he talked on about his job with the Joint Intelligence Staff of NATO and the difficulty of maintaining security in an organization where so many nationalities were represented, Bond reflected that good Americans were fine people and that most of them seemed to come from Texas. Felix Leiter was about 35. He was tall with a thin, bony frame, and his lightweight, tan-colored suit hung loosely from his shoulders like the clothes of Frank Sinatra. His movements and speech were slow, but one had a feeling that there was plenty of speed and strength in him and that he would be a tough and cruel fighter. As he sat hunched over the table, he seemed to have the some of the jackknife quality of a falcon. There was this impression also in his face, in the sharpness of his chin and cheekbones, and the wide wry mouth. His grey eyes had a feline slant, which was increased by his habit of screwing them up against the smoke of the Chesterfields, which he tapped out of the pack in a chain. The permanent wrinkles which this habit had etched at the corners gave the impression that he smiled more with his eyes than with his mouth. A mop of straw-coloured hair lent his face a boyish look, which closer examination contradicted. Although he seemed to talk quite openly about his duties in Paris, Bond soon noticed that he never spoke of his American colleagues in Europe or in Washington, and he guessed that Leiter held the interests of his own organization far above the mutual concerns of the North Atlantic Allies. Bond sympathized with him. By the time Leiter had swallowed another whiskey and Bond had told him about the Munces and his short reconnaissance trip down the coast that morning, it was 7.30, and they decided to stroll over to their hotel together. Before leaving the casino, Bond deposited his total capital of 24 million at the case, keeping only a few notes of 10 mil as pocket money. As they walked across to the Splendide, they saw that a team of workmen was already busy at the scene of the explosion. Several trees were uprooted, and hoses from three municipal tank cars were washing down the boulevard and pavements. The bomb crater had disappeared, and only a few passers-by had paused to gape. Bond assumed that similar facelifting had already been carried out at the Hermitage, and to the shops and frontages which had lost their windows. In the warm blue dusk, Royal Les Eaux was once again orderly and peaceful. "'Who's the concierge working for?' asked Leiter as they approached the hotel. Bond was not sure, and said so. But these had been unable to enlighten him. Unless you have bought him yourself, he had said, you must assume that he has been bought by the other side. All concierges are venal. It's not their fault. They are trained to regard all hotel guests except Maharajas as potential cheats and thieves. They have as much concern for your comfort or well-being as crocodiles. Bond remembered Mathis's pronouncement when the concierge hurried up to inquire whether he had recovered from his most unfortunate experience of the afternoon. Bond thought it well to say that he still felt a little shaky. He hoped that if the intelligence were relayed, the chief would at any rate start playing that evening with a basic misinterpretation of his adversary's strength. The concierge proffered glycerin hopes for Bond's recovery. Ledger's room was on one of the upper floors, and they parted company at the lift after arranging to see each other at the casino at around half-past ten or eleven, the usual hour for high tables to begin play.